Hello, and welcome to worship. Today we are continuing our series, Love in Action. And so far we have seen some of the, the difficult aspects of love. We saw that love carries a cross, that love leaves no one behind. And last week we saw that, that love forgives without limit. And today we see that love isn't fair. And we might hear that and think, well, that doesn't sound like a good thing at all, right? We, we desire fairness. But if God was fair with us, if he gave us just what it is that we deserved, well, then we would receive punishment. Then we would be separated from him for all eternity. And so instead, God does the most unjust thing and most unfair thing in the world. He forgives us for all of our sins. He treats us as though we had never sinned at all. And all this he can do only through Christ, whom he punishes in our place. Now, love isn't fair. It is gracious, and it is forgiving. If you'd like to follow along with the service, you can find a link to a worship folder uh, in the video description just below this video. And God's blessings on your worship. We'll begin our worship in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear friends, let us approach God with a true heart and confess our sins, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to forgive us. Lord of life, I confess that I am by nature dead in sin, for faithless worrying and selfish pride, for sins of habit and sins of choice. For the evil I have done and the good I have failed to do you should cast me away from your presence forever. O oh Lord, I am sorry for my sins. Forgive me for Jesus' sake. Christ has died. Christ is risen. And Christ will come again. In his great mercy, God made us alive in Christ, even when we were dead in our trespasses and sins. Therefore, hear the word of Christ through his called servant. I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And let us pray. Lord God, you call us to work in your kingdom, and you leave no one standing idle. Help us to order our lives by your wisdom, and to serve you in willing obedience. We ask this through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And we'll continue with our scripture lessons. In our Old Testament lesson, we see the prophet Jonah upset because he wanted the wicked city of Nineveh to, to be destroyed. In his mind, it would only be fair. And yet, God gives them what they don't deserve. Right? He gives the people of that city compassion and forgiveness. We read from Jonah chapter 4 and read verses 5 through 11. And Jonah had gone out and sat down at a place east of the city. And there he made himself a shelter, sat in its shade, and waited to see what would happen to the city. Then the Lord God provided a leafy plant and made it grow up over Jonah to give shade for his head to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was happy with the plant. But at dawn the next day, God provided a worm, which chewed the plant so that it withered. When the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind, and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. He wanted to die and said, It would be better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, Is it right for you to be angry about the plant? It is, he said, and I'm so angry I wish I were dead. But the Lord said, You have been concerned about this plant, though you did not tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and died overnight. And should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh, in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left, and also many animals. 
This is the word of our Lord. In our second lesson, it tells us that that God's eternal election of us to salvation, it has nothing to do with, with our merit, with our earning it in any way, but it stems only from God's grace and mercy. We read from Romans chapter 9, verses 6 through 16. For not all who are descended from Israel are Israel, nor because they are his descendants are they all Abraham's children. On the contrary, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. In other words, it is not the natural children who are God's children, but it is the children of the promise who are as regarded as Abraham's offspring. For this was how the promise was stated. At the appointed time I will return, and Sarah will have a son. Not only that, but Rebekah's children had one and the same father, our father Isaac. Yet before the twins were born or had done anything good or bad, in order that God's purpose and election might stand, not by works but by him who calls, she was told, the older will serve the younger. Just as it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. What then shall we say? Is God unjust? No, not at all. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. It does not therefore depend on man's desire or effort, but on God's mercy. This is the word of our Lord. Our gospel lesson for today comes from Matthew chapter 20, and I'll read verses 1 through 16, and this gospel message will serve as the basis for the sermon. Jesus says, For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius for the day and then sent them into his vineyard. About nine in the morning he went out and saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. He told them, you also go and work in my vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. He went out again about noon and about three in the afternoon and did the same thing. About five in the afternoon, he went out and found still others standing around. He asked them, why have you been standing here all day long doing nothing? Because no one has hired us, they answered. He said to them, you also go and work in my vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, Call the workers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last ones hired going on to the first. The workers who were hired about five in the afternoon came and each received a denarius. So when those who came who were hired first, they expected to receive more. But each of them also received a denarius. When they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. These who were hired last worked only one hour, they said, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the work in the heat of the day. But he answered one of them, I am not being unfair to you, friend. Didn't you agree to work for Denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give the one who was hired last the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious? because I am generous. And so the last will be first, and the first will be last. This is the gospel of our Lord. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, you know, it seems as though children are always hypersensitive of when things aren't perfectly fair. Just as an example, so every morning, just about every morning at least, I turn on some cartoons for my children. All right, they start out pretty much every day watching cartoons while drinking juice on the couch. All right, they're, they're just living the dream. But we start out just about every morning that way, and far too often an argument ensues about whose turn it is to pick out the cartoon that day. And in their minds, there is no, there is no greater injustice than getting that order mixed up so that the same person picks out the cartoon two days in a row. It, it's a tra- tragedy of injustice. Have you ever had that kind of experience with maybe your children or grandchildren? You know, have you ever made the, 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 the terrible mistake of maybe giving just a slightly unequal pile of goldfish crackers to them? 
And again, it, it's a great travesty, right? It's a great injustice that must be rectified. Well, when things like that happen, I, I kind of want to tell my children, you know, if you're going to get that upset about little things like this, well, life is going to be tough for you. Because life is full of unfair injustices, isn't it? And the older we get, the, the more we just become accustomed and used to them. Right? We understand that life isn't fair. But one place where we do expect fairness is from God. I mean, it would stand to reason that, that if God is perfect, and of course he is, well then it would make sense then that he would be perfectly fair. But then the problem is that our scripture lessons for today, they seem to be telling us just the opposite, that God, in fact, is not fair. I mean, that has to be the big takeaway from that parable in our gospel lesson, isn't it? Right, that through it, Jesus seems to be telling us that we cannot expect God to operate by our understandings of fairness. And understanding that, that parable which Jesus told, I, I think it, it helps to understand what took place just prior to this parable. Right, just before Jesus told this parable, a well-to-do young man came up to Jesus and asked him a, an important question. He asked Jesus, what must I do to be saved? One of the, one of the problems with the question was that this young man, he really wasn't looking for answers from Jesus so much as he was looking for validation from Jesus that what he has done is good enough, that he had already met the requirements. He wanted Jesus to tell him that he had kept the law well enough so that now he will be saved. Arrogantly, this young man boasted, I have kept all of the commandments. And so Jesus, knowing the idols that this rich young man had set up in his heart, he told him then, well, go and, and sell all of your possessions Give the proceeds to the poor, leave it all behind, and then come and follow me. And this rich young man, he turned away sad. He couldn't do it. He loved his wealth, he loved his stuff far too much to, to sell it and to leave it behind and follow Jesus. He went from arrogantly boasting to incredibly humbled. But then it seems as though Jesus' disciples that they started to boast a little bit. Right, they got some big heads because what Jesus had told this rich young man to do, they, in a sense, had already done. And so Peter says to Jesus, We have left everything to follow you. What then will there be for us? The disciples were now the ones needing to be humbled. Now they had become the ones boasting, saying, Jesus, look at what we have done for you. What do we get? It's in this context that Jesus tells us this parable. Jesus says that, that there is an owner of a vineyard who went out early in the morning looking to hire some workers for his, for his field. Jesus is picturing for us what, what would have been a very common scene in first century Palestine. Freelance laborers would oftentimes meet at a marketplace or some other commonly known location. They would go there in the morning in hopes of being hired by someone that, for work that day. And that would especially be the case during the harvest season when there was a lot of work to be done. And so this owner of the vineyard, he goes to the marketplace to hire some workers. And he finds some there and, and he says, come work in my vineyard and I'll pay you a denarius. And a denarius would have been a generous but a fair kind of common wage for a day's work. But later on in the day, or later that morning, the, the owner, he goes back to that marketplace and he sees that there are still workers standing there idle. And so he says, come, come work in my vineyard and, and I'll pay you whatever is fair. And apparently there was plenty of work to be done that day because that owner of the vineyard, he goes back again at noon and then he goes back again at three and he hires more workers yet. And then finally, he even goes back at 5 o'clock when there was just one hour's worth of work left, and he hires more workers yet. Well, finally, at the end of the day, pay time comes. It's time for the workers to receive their wage. And so you can imagine everyone's shock 
when those who were hired at five and worked just one hour received a denarius. Again, that would have been a generous pay for an entire day's work. And so when those who were hired early in the day saw this, we can imagine they got a big smile on their face, thinking, boy, if if they got a denarius for working just one hour, what are we going to get who have worked 12 hours, who worked in the heat of the day? What are we going to receive? But then those, those smiles, they start to fade. When those who were hired at three, and then those who were hired at noon, also received just that one denarius. And then finally, when those who, who were hired at nine in the morning received that same denarius, we can imagine they were filled with outrage. Right? This isn't fair. And, and we can understand, right? They had a right to complain, it would seem. We would be outraged too. Back when, when I was in college, I had a job working a few days a week in a factory in town close to school. And to be honest, the job was incredibly boring and monotonous. And one of the, the common jobs that we had in this factory, which is one of my least favorite, it was filling little plastic tubes up with grease. And to this day, I have no idea what those tubes of grease were used for and who bought them. But again, it was a common job we had there. And so if you had that job for the day, you had to sit at this machine all by yourself. And then to the left of you, there would be this, this big box filled with these empty plastic tubes. And so you'd grab a tube, you'd put it in a certain place in the machine, and it would seal the bottom of it. And then you'd take that tube, and then you'd put it somewhere else in the machine to be filled with grease, and it had to be filled to just the right level. And then you would close that tube up, and then you would throw it on a box to your right, just filled with these tubes already filled with grease. And then you'd get that one done, and then you'd start over again and get a new one, and on and on it would go. And you had to do this for like eight hours. Right, an eight-hour shift. Again, it was incredibly boring work. Well, at this factory, there was a, a bunch of college students who worked there, especially on the weekends. But there was one guy in particular who, when he worked the grease tube machine, he just gave 110% effort. Right? We, we had to keep track of how many we did, right, so the supervisor could know, I suppose. And, and his numbers, they always just blew the rest of ours away. It was unbelievable how fast he filled these tubes with grease. And if, and if, there, if filling tubes with grease was in the Olympics and there was a gold medal given for it, he most certainly would have won it. But of course, that is not an event in the Olympics. There is no gold medal given for filling the most tubes with grease. And in fact, at the end of the day, he got the same pay as the rest of us. And that's really not fair, is it? I mean, should the one who, who gave 110% effort get paid the same as some who were probably giving less than 25% effort? Right? It's not fair. It's even less fair that those who work 12 hours should receive the same pay as those who worked one hour. There's no justice there. It's not fair. Well, fairness is what the disciples thought they wanted from God. Because in their understanding of fairness, they thought, well, that would mean then that, that they would be rewarded, that they should be compensated for, for doing what that rich young man could not do and being willing to leave everything behind to follow Jesus. Well, are we ever tempted to compare ourselves to others and then think, boy, if, if only God were fair, right? if God were fair, well then, well, then he would really look upon me with favor. Then he would really be answering all of my prayers and my life would just be, be showered with all of these, these blessings. You know, we can convince ourselves that, that God works on this merit-based system with us and when we start thinking that way, we might start asking questions like, did God notice when I put that little extra money in the offering plate? I hope he was paying attention. Did God notice how I volunteered to clean the bathrooms at church this week? Was he paying attention to that? Has God noticed how good of a spouse I've been lately? You know, like the disciples, we can become a little bit boastful and start saying, Lord, look at what all I have done for you. Now, what are you going to do for me? You know, I think this parable, it really shows us, and what led up to this parable, I think it really shows us just how determined the devil is. I think it shows us just, just how many different tactics that he can take. You know, if, if the devil can convince you that, 
that you're, the material things and your wealth and the stuff you have in this world, if he can convince you that that is more important in your life than God, well then of course you'll be happy to go that route. If the devil can convince you to be selfish and self-serving with your time and your talents, your treasures, well then of course he'll go that route. But if those and other similar temptations and tactics aren't working, well then he'll just simply switch gears a little bit. And he'll seek to fill your hearts with self-righteousness. He'll seek to lead you to, to, to look down upon others, compare yourself to them, and, and say, well, Lord, in comparison to them, what are you going to give for me? Right? In comparison to them, I've done so much more and I've been so much better. Well, the vineyard owner, he really gave a perfect answer to those workers who were complaining about his wages, didn't he? He said, am I being unfair to you, friend? Didn't you agree to work for denarius? He then ends by saying, or are you envious because I am generous? You know, the reality is, the owner of this vineyard, he didn't shortchange anyone, did he? The only thing he could be accused of was being exceedingly generous. And that's really exactly the point. No, God is not fair. But his unfairness does not lie with him shortchanging people or giving people less than what they deserve. No, God's unfairness only lies in this, that he is exceedingly gracious and generous. He gives us that which we do not deserve. You know, the reality is that fair isn't loving, is it? I mean, fair isn't a loving thing. To, to fair is, is to give people what is expected, to give them what they deserve. We don't need a God who is fair. Right? If God was fair with us, if he gave us what we deserve, well, then we would receive punishment from him. What we need is a God who is not fair. We need a God who is gracious and, and gives us abundant blessings that we do not deserve. I mean, think about it. If, if God was fair with us, think about all the things that we wouldn't have. I mean, is, is it fair that God would call you by his gospel out of this dark world? Is it fair that God would bring you to the waters of baptism and, and there wash you clean of your sin, adopt you into his family, and, and make you an heir of heaven? Is that fair? Can you say that you did anything to, to earn or merit your place in God's family? Right, of course not, right? Children don't earn their place in their family, nor can we do so to earn a place in God's family. It's all by his grace. Right? Is it fair that, that God chose you, that he called you, that he baptized you, made you his child? None of that is fair. But it's incredibly gracious. Or is it fair that God should heap all of your sins and all of my sins upon his only son? Is it fair that the one who knew no sin, who didn't sin even once in thought or word or deed, is it fair that he should become sin for us? Is it fair that the one who is absolutely perfect, perfect in his love, perfect in his obedience, is it fair that, that he, the only one who walked on this earth who did not deserve hell, that he should suffer hell in our place so that we can receive the heaven that we do not deserve? Is any of that fair? No, again, of course it's not fair, but it's incredibly gracious. And that's exactly what we need. But all of this, I think it begs the question, or at least it begs the question of our sinful nature. And that question is, well, why then would we seek to work in labor, in the vineyard of God's kingdom, if it doesn't merit us anything? Right? If we can't have bragging rights about it, why would we do it? You know, just to go back to that example of that guy I worked with in the factory, Again, he gave 110% effort. He was so energetic in filling up those grease tubes, he went above and beyond. But guess what happened when he learned that he wasn't going to get any more money for it? Right? He stopped trying. What was the point? What was the reason? Why would he go above and beyond? Why would he do that if it wasn't going to earn him a higher wage? We might be tempted to ask the same question, or again, at least our sinful nature would. You know, why? Why, why? why seek to obey God's will? Why serve God and others? Why give our offerings? Why volunteer to clean the bathrooms at church? Why do all of those things if it's not going to earn or merit us anything before God? 
Well, the answer is because we want to please God. And why do we want to please God? Well, it's because God loves us. A professor of, of theology at, at the college I went to, he, he put it in a very simple way that I liked. He, he said that, that we cannot love God near as much as he loves us. And of course, we understand that's true. Right? The Bible tells us that, that God's love for us it is higher, it is greater than the heavens are above the earth. We cannot come close to matching God's incredible love for us. We never can meet his love. But he said the goal of Christian living is to constantly be seeking to narrow that gap. You know, in all those God-pleasing things that I mentioned earlier, of course, yes, God notices them. Yes, of course, God sees them. He sees it all. And of course, God is pleased with them. But he is pleased when his children seek to honor him, to serve him, to obey him, and glorify him with their lives. Not because it earns anything from him, but because they love him who first loved us. God is not fair. And for that we rejoice. God does not give us what we deserve. No, he gives us the bountiful blessings. He gives us the forgiveness of sins. He gives us the promise of eternal life and paradise with him that we do not deserve. Thanks be to God. Amen. And the peace of God, which surpasses all human understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. We'll continue by confessing our faith together, and we'll use the words of the Nicene Creed. And again, you can find this printed in the worship folder. We confess. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the Scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. We'll continue with prayer. Lord of power and grace, whose eyes are on the righteous and whose ears are open to their cry, hear the prayer of your people as we come now in thankfulness for the mercies that you pour down on us anew each day. We thank you for the gifts of your mighty providence. Make us mindful, O Lord, that you have provided us with life, breath, and being and are the source of our daily bread. We praise you for the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, whom you sent to be the Savior of the world. Grant that we may believe in him with all our hearts, learning from him the great truths of the kingdom to which he bore faithful witness. Grant us your Holy Spirit, that we may produce the fruits of righteousness. May he endow us with an unwavering faith, that we may always be ready to do your will. Lord, we pray for the nations of the earth. Subdue terror and tyranny everywhere and call forth leaders who acknowledge that you are Lord over all the earth. Bless our own land, and may it ever follow that which is good, and turn from all that which is wicked, that our people may prosper in uprightness and integrity. Hear, O Lord, our cry for those who are afflicted. Grant them health and body and soul, and save them 
for your mercy's sake. Guide and uphold us during our pilgrimage in this world, and bring us all to our heavenly home. Receive these petitions in the name of the Prince of Life, Jesus our Lord. And we join together in the prayer which he taught. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen.